the best response you can have to a payoff in a thriller is someone goes, oh, right, I forgot, of course, I should have oh, yeah. Fawn Story offers a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. All of our content is recorded live at Austin Film Festival and at our year-round events. To view previous episodes, visit OnStory.tv. OnStory is brought to you in part by the Alice Kleberg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. Support for OnStory comes from Bogle Family Vineyards, sixth generation farmers and third generation winemakers, creating sustainably grown wines that are a reflection of the Bogle family values since 1968. From Austin Film Festival, this is On Story, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. This week's On Story, sole co-writer and co-director and One Night in Miami writer, Kemp Powers. Jazz really was perfect, both as a metaphor for the meaning of the film itself and the fact that no one really pursues being an instrumental jazz musician who wants to be rich and famous. It's such a niche genre of music. It's obvious by the fact that they're doing it that they don't care about wealth and fame. This week on On Story, Kemp Powers, co-writer, co-director of Academy Award-winning Soul, and writer of Academy Award-nominated One Night in Miami, talks about the process of adapting his own play and what is needed to build compelling narrative. One of the things I think is so interesting about both One Night in Miami and Soul is that they're both intensely reflective films. And One Night is centered on the here and now and, and of that evening and really focused on the men's individual struggles and their shared reflection. And then Soul, uh, obviously centered on the who am I, what am I, where am I kind of um, existential uh, journey, but both are essentially existential in nature. As a writer who's written for almost every form of media, I'd like to hear you talk about how all of those backgrounds um, helped you write two pieces that are so reflective. It's interesting because the reflective nature of these, these two projects is part of what made them um, so special to me. And uh, like, honestly, such a multi-year odyssey. It's really, it feels like a miracle that both of them got made, uh, to, to be perfectly honest. I mean, in the case of One Night in Miami, um, it had been, it, it's a play, it started as a play that I wrote that allowed me to explore the, these issues that are, that are really personally important to me. And they have been ever since I was a young man. They're issues that are prominent in my community. They're discussions that have been had since long before that night in Miami and they're discussions still being had today. It's about what if any greater social responsibility do you have when you're a, when you're a black public figure? Um, and, 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 you know, the, the issue of can I just be a writer or director? Does it have to be a black writer director? The, these, are, these are issues that I think it's not just specific to black people, it's specific to, to any different group um, when they get into a business like, like entertainment. And, um, and Soul, I mean, I, I think it was just incredible. Well, you know what, now that I think about it, part of the reason I got that Pete Doctor reached out to me to work on Soul was because he read the play One Night in Miami. So I think he saw in that piece um, me kind of going through this exploration, and that's exactly the, the type of thing that, if you know Pete Doctor's work at Pixar, he's kind of the guy who does like to ask the big questions. He's definitely one of those creators who likes to kind of swing for the fences and ask those big types of questions. And I think of other works that I that I that maybe didn't find a big audience that I found pretty amazing. I love stuff that kind of explores what we're doing here on this planet, you know, like what, what is our purpose? What are we meant to be doing? 
And, and I just think that coincidentally, one night in Miami, writing that, getting that done, it kind of became a bit of a calling card, um, specifically to, to Pete when he was looking for a writer to help him you know, execute the story that was literally about the, the very type of thing that I, that I tend to explore. You spent so many years as a journalist, right? Almost 20 years. Yeah, 17 or 18, yeah. Yeah, and so you 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 move you go from there to being a dramatist, and and that um, to me is particularly interesting. And in the thing you chose for this play is that it's a newsy story, right? It's funny. The first draft of One Night in Miami was awful for so many different reasons, but chief among them was that it was basically just a book report. Um, it just was not. I, I was so caught up in the reality of it in my own research. You know, when I when I first found out about this night, I went about a personal journey of doing research on each of those four men with the intention of writing a book about their friendship. So I really first tackled that night with a journalist's eye. But when I then made the switch over to writing it as a work of drama, it took me a little while to convince myself to kind of let go of the reality and to just use everything that I knew that really happened, everything that I really knew about each of those four men to basically then just create for all intents and purposes an avatar <laughs> you know that I was then going to put into a situation that was a situation of my of my creation um, so it's like okay how do I think Cassius Clay at 22 years old would behave in this situation how do I think Sam Cook on this particular night with everything going on in his life would react to being challenged by a Malcolm X on this on this situation I mean the wonderful thing about the the journalistic aspect of it is there was a scenario that was a very hooky kind of scenario it wasn't very hard to get people interested in the idea of the of that night especially as a stage play but I'll admit a lot of people, what they got when they sat in the theater um, was not what they signed up for. <laughs> a lot of people did not want to come into a film with a, a, a play with a boxer, a football player, um, and, and a singer and have no boxing, no football, you know, and, all, and very, very little singing. And, and really just getting to the core of who these guys were as men and their insecurities. That was not what a lot of people wanted, but that was the me of it. That's what I wanted. You opened the, the movie uh, in, I think, a really interesting way to me. It was kind of through me, actually, that having these four sequences of humiliation for each of these fellows and a, a moment of... Uh, people who were all at some point very much on the top of their game, but starting this movie um, where they each had a moment of utter kind of humiliation or despair. And so I'd, I'd really love to hear why that made it into the opening of the film. I wanted to show the wound that each man brought into that night. Um, and it, it was as simple as that. It was like each of them carrying a wound into the room a wound that most of the public, with the exception of the case of Cassius Clay, who almost lost to Henry Cooper very publicly, most people were not aware of, of the wounds that they were carrying into the room that night. And I think that it helped put each of them into a greater context. Because again, you see them as always winning, always at the top of their game. And it was important to put them into a more nuanced context to understand all the reasons they would have to be insecure at this time in their lives when they were, at least to the public, seeming like they were on top of the world. When you're talking about people watching this, though, who are coming in this movie in their 20s or their 30s, with real lack of familiarity probably for most people, other than Muhammad Ali, maybe not even knowing that his name was Cassius Clay. On the night that this happened, all of us know the most famous person is Muhammad Ali of these four. And you could argue that based on today, today's knowledge, Malcolm X is probably the second most famous. But on that particular night, the most famous person in the room was Sam Cooke, followed closely, very closely by Jim Brown. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, and, and that's an important thing to remember is that I had to let go of thinking about what people know or don't know so that I could create a realistic power dynamic. And that was a power dynamic of three older brothers whose younger brother is about to make an important decision and they disagree about what he should be doing. So it's, it's like basically Muhammad Ali is almost a Trojan horse. The reason we're here is to celebrate 
Tess's official transition. Ma. Transition? <clears throat> to what? Can we give them news caches? Well, I suppose if uh, you want to tell them, Malcolm. Now, wait a second. You ain't about to say what I think you're going to say. Now, I've been thinking long and hard about it, boys, and I'm officially joining the Nation of Islam. <laughs> Cassius, are you sure that's such a good idea? Well, why not? Well, I thought this Muslim jive was something to rile up. White no, folks. it's no jive, Sam. Cameras are off. He became oh. champion on his own terms. Naysayers be... We all just go out and declare the white man the devil. Oh, why not? Huh? We're entering a new time where no one can hold us back from voicing our honest opinions. Look at Jimmy. Jimmy hasn't bitten his tongue for one day of his career. Well... You ain't lying. In writing, particularly the debate between Malcolm and Sam, it was like trying to play a game of chess against myself. It's, it's that challenge when we're kids, when we're doing, if you ever do speech and debate, and, and it's like pro or con. So, you know, first I'm gonna do the pro, then I'm gonna do the con. And the roller coaster ride of the film itself, I wanted to make sure that when each character was making his strongest point, that it felt almost airtight. <laughs> so that when the counterpoint was made, that it, again, when, if, if it works well, which, it, which it, 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 it did with a lot of people, when the counterpoint is made, it makes it more powerful because you are 100% going, you know what, Sam is absolutely right. I'm 100% behind it. His logic is infallible. To then get a counterpoint that the logic is equally infallible. You know, because ultimately you should not come down feeling like one side is right or wrong. That, that's, the, that's the ultimate reality of their entire debate, is that Sam and Malcolm simply represent two sides of my psyche. You know, they're all you, you it's my internal monologue. <laughs> One of the things that I was most interested in as far as um, how you chose to add this in and utilize it is the relationship with Malcolm X's relationship with his wife, Betty. That's actually one of my favorite little moments in the film. And, and, and it really speaks to how wonderful it was to collaborate with Regina King, the, the director, because we were already having the, the, the writing the script. It was, it was already necessary because of the fact that it wasn't real time. And we were having time cuts to move the characters around a lot more when they got to the hotel. It couldn't just be something that took place in a room. It had to be in parking lots, in phone booths, on the roof. All those set scenarios were not present in the play. So it was about moving them around and giving them adequate reasons to, to move around. And Regina, in doing her own research, which was wonderful, she actually reached out to the daughters of a lot of these men. And she had a wonderful conversation with Ambassador Shabazz, um, Atala Shabazz, who was Malcolm X's oldest daughter. And one of the things that really jumped out at her was that Ambassador Shabazz said that when her father was on the road, he would hide notes around the house to send them on scavenger hunts. Um, so he'd call and be like, give them clues, and they would find the notes, and they'd be these really sweet letters he wrote to his daughters. And I never heard about that before. So when Regina told me that, I was like, wow, you just like, Talk about an incredible little detail to paint an, a nuanced picture of the, who this man is as a father. All right, well, I need you to get down from the stool. I want you to take three big jumps forward. And look to your left. Now what's in front of you? Books. Books, that's right. Now I want you to take one of those books. Which one? It's your favorite number. One, two, three, four, five, six. There you go. Now open it up and take a look inside. You see it? Thank you, Daddy. Obviously, Pixar takes risks, and they have this, um, what seems like very much not a kid's movie. Uh, seems very directed at people who are probably over 30 in particular, you know, um, and, and just, it's just an, an interesting uh, kind of battle between the existential and the nihilistic and a very esoteric concept for uh, an animated film. Jazz really was perfect, both 
as a metaphor for the meaning of the film itself and the fact that no one really pursues being an instrumental jazz musician who wants to be rich and famous. So that really kind of worked, I think, for, um, for, for the purposes of the story. I had lots of questions about this Joe Gardner character. I said, like, you know, how old is he? And Pete was like, well, we see him as about 45. You know, I'm 45. He's from New York. I'm from New York. So as I was asking these questions and they're answering, and it sounds like they're describing me, that kind of became the fuel for me to fill in all the blanks of, of this character. I think that's why it was just such the perfect fit. Plus this whole idea of, of like a dream deferred, the idea that Joe has been pursuing this dream of music far past the point at which he should have given up, which pretty much reflects my own screenwriting career. Um, <laughs> because, you know, if you speak to, I mean, the scene with Joe speaking to his mother I mean, it's basically not almost verbatim a conversation I had with my own mom. Our prayers have been answered. A full-time job. Working man Wonderful. coming through. Yeah, mom, but I... You're going to tell them yes, right? Don't worry, mom, I got a plan. You always got a plan. Maybe you need to have a backup plan, too, for when your plan falls through. A backup plan never hurts. Joey, we didn't struggle giving you an education so you could be a middle-aged man washing your underwear in my shop. Mm -hmm. Walking around with a hole in his pants. Yeah, but With this job, you'll be able to put that dead-end gigging behind you. And Lord knows we need more teachers in this world. And just think, playing music will finally be your real career. So you're going to tell them yes, right? Please say yes. Yeah, definitely. Good. It was pretty easy to just pull from my experiences as someone who was getting older and older and older and still chasing this insane dream. To, to understand emotionally all the things that the character was going through. So I, I just, I, I tell people, I think I, I, am, I think I was just like the perfect person at the perfect time for this perfect project. Because as soon as I came on board as a writer, I felt like Joe was me. You know, I felt like this story was as much my story as it was Pete's, you know? And it was very much Pete's story. If you talk to Pete Doctor, you'll hear about, you know, Joe's, we can both, it's so funny, we can talk about a completely different set of experiences, and they both equally reflect Joe Gardner. So it really is a, a, a wonderful um, mashup <laughs> of, of the people involved. The suit scene is so deep and rich, and, and it's just thick, you know, it takes us from where Joe stops just trying to run the treadmill and actually starts thinking about why he's running the treadmill. And that was actually one of the first scenes I wrote when I came on board. Because, um, you know, you write animated films out of sequence. Um, and, and there was already a decision that, like, the, the story was at a point where we knew Joe um, would need to get his, a gig suit. Um, the, the, the getting of a nice suit used to be a much bigger component of the story. It was, like, literally the details of the suit were, like, dominating the story. But it, but it was always a, a big part of it. And I think it was one of our story artists who made the suggestion that the suit be his father's. I'm just afraid that if I died today, that my life would have amounted to nothing. Joey. Let's make this work instead. That's my dad's suit. Lulu, Melba, bring your good scissors oh, in here. Oh. We got work to do. Wow, this feels really nice. You look mom. It fits perfect. Mm -hmm. You see how I do it? Better one fine wool suit if I do say so myself. Uh, can I try on that? Of course you can. Just handsome. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mom. Ray would have been so proud of you, baby. Like I've always been. We had a lot of questions about, was Joe doing this because his dad was a jazz, jazz musician? And you know, it would be very possible for his mother to interpret his passion for jazz as simply wanting to follow in his father's footsteps. And the point of that scene was for her to see who Joe was and what it meant to him and how it was not about 
his connection to his father. In fact, it was about this fact that he can't feel, if he's not doing that, he cannot feel satisfied in his life. And if he has to fail and be poor for the rest of his life, he's willing to accept that in order to do the one thing that gives him that satisfaction. You know, so not doing it, not pursuing his music for him is, is, is a kind of death almost. And, and, and that's, that's honestly how I feel about what I do. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, it's, it's not necessarily being brave. Um, it's, it's more like, I don't know what else to do. And of course, the journey of Joe with 22, particularly during the body swap portion, is what both gives him the tools and the idea of finally having the conversation with his mother that he has never had before. In particular, when they get to the, um, the barber shop um, and, and the scene in the shop and, you know, both learning all these things about Des, the barber, who he would have called a friend, and the fact that seeing 22's jazzing, her improvisation, the very thing that he should do naturally being a jazz musician, he won't do in life. And learning that he kind of has to wing it in certain situations where he feels uncomfortable. Wait, but you were born to be a barber, weren't you? I wanted to be a veterinarian. So why didn't you do that? I was planning to when I got out of the Navy. Then my daughter got sick. And <laughs> Barber school is a lot cheaper than veterinarian school. Well, that's too bad. You're stuck as a barber, and now you're unhappy. Whoa, whoa, slow your road here, Joe. I'm happy as a clam, my man. Not everyone can be Charles Drew inventing blood transfusions. Or me, playing piano with Dorothea Williams, I know. <laughs> you are not all that. Anyone could play in a band if they wanted to. Don't pay Paul any mind. People like him just bring other people down so they can make themselves feel better. Oh, I get it. He's just criticizing me to cover up the pain of his own failed dreams. <laughs> Cut deep, Joe. I wonder why sitting in this chair makes me want to tell you things, Des. That's the magic of the chair. That's why I love this job. I get to meet interesting folks like you, make them happy, and make them handsome. Wow, am I crazy or do I look younger? I may not have invented blood transfusions, but I am most definitely saving lives. 22 is almost Joe's alter ego, yeah. and and 22 really um, is they're each their own they're, they're each their own antagonists. They're always pushing up against themselves, which is really unique, right? It's also very unique for animation, but particularly unique for storytelling in general. That was an interesting journey as well because you, you know 20 and in the initial pitches we would always say that 22 was a know-it-all teenager who really knew it all. Like imagine if your the attitude of a know-it-all teenager was backed up by that teenager actually having spent thousands of years learning <laughs> about everything. Because it's like if that if that teenager learned everything there is to know about Earth, they would see the daily hypocrisy in everything that we do and go, forget it. Like I don't I want nothing to do with that. So, you know, people should get 22's point of of view. And, and, and it was a, you know, there was one version of the film where the main character was 20. That was another thing. Pixar has a tendency to do buddy films where it's, you know, it's two mismatched characters, you know, on the road together going back to Woody and Buzz, and Buzz Lightyear. And while there's definitely buddy elements of this film, I think as it progressed, it was important that it became less of a buddy film and more Joe Gardner's story. Because in initial iterations, it was 22 story where it was all about this soul who does not want to go to live on Earth because of so and all these things, and this Joe character inspiring her to, to want to go. And then in, in middling iterations, it kind of became more of a, a, a classic buddy story, but then it really wasn't working because for any number of reasons, that would be like a whole other set of conversations. But then it finally started to click and work when it became this is Joe Gardner's story, and every other secondary character is just that. They're secondary, and they're there in service to Joe's story and Joe's growth. And, that, and that's really the, that ended up being the, the, the sweet spot, I think, for the, for the 22 character that took her from being annoying, because she was very annoying in earlier versions, to a character that the audience really wants to protect. 
in the same way that Joe ends up wanting to protect her by, by the end of the film. You've been watching a conversation with Kemp Powers on On Story. On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story project that also includes the On Story radio program, podcast, book series, and the On Story archive, accessible through the Whitliff Collections at Texas State University. To find out more about On Story and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com. Want to see On Story live? Join us at Austin Film Festival's annual Writers Conference each October. Visit www.austinfilmfestival.com to find out more about badges and passes to attend the festival.